الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم آلك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين إهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا السلام عليكم ورحمة الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر لا إله إلا الله الله أكبر ولله الحمد الله أكبر الله أكبر لا إله إلا الله الله أكبر الله أكبر ولله الحمد الله أكبر كبير كبيرا والحمد الحمد والحمد لله كبيرا الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر لا إله إلا الله الله أكبر الله أكبر ولله الحمد. Praise be to Allah. Eid Mubarak, everybody. Uh, this is a, a special uh, Eid. This is Eid Al Adha or the Eid of Sacrifice. And this Eid is. Uh, focused on the life of Ibrahim alayhi salam. Of course we know that Ibrahim lived in a society about 4,000 years ago, and that society, they worship the, the heavenly bodies. And so Ibrahim was the son of Azar, who was the chief idol maker. In other words, he was born in a society that all he had to do was go along with the program and he's going to inherit a powerful position. That is the chief idol maker in the society and under him, I mean over him is only the king. Right? And so, but he looks at the sun, he looks at the moon and the different phases and he says they can't be the God. They can't be the thing that deserves to be worshipped because they rise, they set, they appear, they reappear, and they disappear. And so Ibrahim, as a young man, he was very conscious 
about his environment. And so, he just went to the item makers and they had their house full of items. <laughs> and he broke all the items except the, the big one. He left an ax and a hand on the big one. And so the people came and they said, what's going on with our idols? Who broke our gods? So Ephraim said, you mean you worship something? First of all, he says, well, why don't you ask the big one there? The one with the accent pain. So they say, you know he can't talk. They said, wait a minute. Y'all are worshiping something that you have fashioned, you have made with your own hands, and you're considering that your Eli, your God, the thing that you are bowing down and worshiping. It can't talk to you, it can't do nothing to you, it can't do nothing for you. So therefore, uh, first the people flashed. They said, that's right. Then they said, burn this guy, man. And they went and set him on fire. But uh, we want to talk a little bit about the conditions that if you accept, accept Allah's mission, they said burn him and protect your gods if you do anything at all. But then they said, well, Allah said, Kul ya na ya na Kuni barda, barda. Wassalaman Allah Ibrahim. You know, in in, uh, in Swahili, when we was in East Africa, when you wanted a cold drink, you would say, Barili San, very cold. Because it's a mixture of Arabic and Bantu. And he, right here, the Quran is using the word Baradan. Baradan means cold. So fire burns, fire consumes, fire destroys things, right? But in this case, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did change the composition of fire. He didn't turn everything upside down and he said, fire, be cool. And a means of taslim and salam, peace and tranquility and safety for Abraham. They threw him in the fire to destroy him, right? Because he didn't mess with their gods. But Allah said to prove, first of all, let me back up. Ibrahim is the father of monotheism. He's the father of monotheism. So, Allah didn't change the condition of the fire. We'll get to the point that in the near future, when you accept Allah's mission, it don't make no difference what the world has to say to you and what to do to you and what they're going to try to do and all of it. It don't make no difference. That Allah is in charge of his universe. And he can change the condition of the universe that everything that was meant to break your back, to destroy you, to overrun you, right, can become a means of your subsistence and elevation. Here's another fact. Inna Ibrahim kana umatan kani tan lallahi hanifan walam yaku min al mushrikeen. Abraham was indeed a model, devoutly obedient to Allah and true in faith, and he joined not gods with Allah. But there's a word, you have to listen to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying. Inna Ibrahim akana umatan. At this time, Ibrahim, one individual person, was the Umar of, uh, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. One person. This is, what this, this is what the Quran is saying. At that time, he was the father of monotheism. 
Remember, Christianity derived from Ibrahim. He sent one son, uh, Ismail, he sent him to Arabia. And his children would be like the sands of the beach and what have you, right? Uh, and his children would come the Arab people and they would flourish. His other son, Isaac, he becomes the father of what you might call the Jewish people. But technically, although their books say that Isaac was sacrificed, it couldn't have been because Ismail was the first son. Never was Ismail the second son. So even in this biblical scripture, it says, sacrifice your first son. The one that you had taken a wife, the Egyptian woman, right, Hadrian, taken her by the law. So if he had taken her by the law, that means they are legally married, right? <laughs> and that's his son. But we don't want to go and get the verdict here. Inna Ibrahim akana umatan kanitan. He is the umma of those days. Hanifan, you know, like they got Hanafi Muslim. You heard Hanifan means he's straight and he's correct. He's durable and what have And he's not one of the Mushrikeen, the one that worship a plurality or multiplicity of gods. He is truly worshiping the one Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So here it says, you know, he, he didn't have all this trouble with all these people. And at his time, he's traveling all over that part of the world. He leaves one son in Palestine, right? He leaves his uncle Lot up in another place on the plain, right? And he leaves his other son in Arabia. If you look at the world at that time, that is the, uh, the crux of the world. That's Mesopotamia area. That's Iraq nowadays, right? That's Samaria. That's the Fertile Crescent. That's where the world so-called started. At that time, so the Tigris and Euphrates, Mesopotamia, that's where he's at. He's in war. He's in Iraq, right? Tigris and Euphrates. That's where he is. At that time, as we said, they are deep into sun worship, the heavenly bodies. So, this is what he says. He's looking at all this stuff. Then he says, Wakala enne zahi bon ila rabbe sayahdin. He said, I will go to my Lord and he will guide me. Sayahdin, when he died. So his prayer is, or his statement is, I will go to Allah, or I will travel in the way of Allah, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give me the hidayah, the guidance. And to all of this stuff I'm wondering about, the Godhead, purpose of life, you know, the universal realities, I will go to my Lord, and he will guide me. Then it goes on to say, O oh, my Lord, grant me a righteous son. So we gave him the good news of a boy ready to suffer and forbear. Then when the son reached the age of serious work with him, he said, O oh, my son, I see in this vision that I offer thee in sacrifice. Now see, what is thy view? The son said, O oh my father, do as thou art commanded. Thou wilt find me, if Allah so wills, one practicing patience and constancy. So, when they had both submitted their wills to Allah, <clears throat> and he had laid him prostrate on his forehead for sacrifice, 
we called out to him, O Abraham, thou hast already fulfilled thy vision. Thus indeed do reward those who do right. For this was obviously a trial, and we ransomed him with a momentous sacrifice. And we left this blessing for him amongst generations to come in later times. Peace and salutations on Abraham. Thus indeed do we reward those who do right. Before going back to the beginning, technically this was the end of human sacrifice. See, before, like you can find tribes, what you could a few years ago, to still practice human sacrifices. The pyramids down in Mexico, Guatemala, and all of that, they practice human sacrifices. I mean, on a large scale. But for people on this side of the world, or on the other side of the world, right, that was the end of human sacrifices. That was the whole dialogue between Ibrahim and his son. So that's why it says, Oh my Lord, grant me a righteous son. So we gave him the good news of a boy ready to suffer and forbear. Now, Allah is telling him, now Ibrahim's not a youngster. Ibrahim was said to be 86 years old at that time. So now if this boy is around 14, the age of serious work, right? Then that makes him 100 years old. His beard, his beard is great. He may have a little touch of arthritis and all kind of stuff. His memory might be going. And then he gets a message from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, sacrifice Ismail. Now here's Ismail. Ismail is not only his son, he's his only son at that time. And this is, he got him when he was 86 years old. He's not a teenager. He has another son later, but he ain't guaranteed no another son. Right? And so, when Allah mentions him to sacrifice his son, he started liking him even more. And then, you know, when we go to Hajj, we throw rocks at the shaitan. Why? The shaitan is doubt. So the shaitan is coming to Abraham. You got the word about sacrifice? Sacrifice your son? The one you love? Well, sacrifice. Does it mean today? Does it mean five years from now? When you get old, when you get 21, does it mean then? Right? This is the shaitan. This is doubt. What should I do? I'm at the height of my career at this time. Sacrifice Ismail? Why, I'm teaching him everything I know, right? I'm passing on in my old age everything that I know, right? So the more he think about it, the more he's becoming attached to his son, but Allah done told him, sacrifice that son. Sacrifice your Ismail. Right? This is a serious choice. What would you do? You throwing rocks at the Satan. Why? Right? Because any time you got something big that you want to do, we were talking about running marathons the other day. When you way out there and you got 15, 16, 18 miles along the way, uh, white people call it the wall. It's not the wall. The shaitan comes to you, why are you running this marathon? Do you get paid for this? Right? You're going to win a prize. All of this work, and some people listen to the shaitan, they got plenty of energy left and they stop. White folks call it the wall. We knew different. We should run marathon. So when, it, when that stuff came up to us, we said, that's the shaitan coming, trying to question us, to get us to question why we're doing what we're doing. You think about it. You're going to do big stuff. You're going to have a serious life, right? You're going to contribute to the development of humanity, and you think the shaitan is not going to come to you 
and make you question yourself when everybody over here is saying one thing, right? And you standing here by yourself. That's why I said Ibrahim was an ummah by himself. That's a bad joke, but I'm telling you, you got to look at it like it is. He's all by himself. He has to stand up for monotheism. Everybody else worship multiplicity of God, plurality of, plurality of God. <laughs> he ought to stand for the one God, all by himself. That's why he is the Ummah, right? That's what the Quran say of those days. So you throwing rocks at the shaitan, you're technically throwing rocks at your own self because it is the shaitan inside of you speaking trying to convince you that that great deed, that great rescue mission you want to go on, whatever it is, you sure you want to do that? Is this night, are you sure you want to sacrifice your son? Say, are you sure? And then us, what about his son is al Halim, ready to forbear. You see yourself sacrificing your father? Don't do what Allah tells you to do. All right? You tell your kid, go wash the dishes, take out the garbage. Take out the garbage, man, let's go play. Man, I'll watch the TV, and he come talk about take out the garbage, make up the bed, you know what I mean, and pay a little bit of the help with the rent a little bit, now that I'm grown, and he want me to do all that, right? That's your kids. <laughs> tell the truth, that's him. What does, what does Ismail say? You saw me getting sacrificed? Go ahead. Right? Don't sweat it. Don't make it hard on yourself. Right? Go ahead and take care of your mission. This is what Allah, there's no doubt in you. It should be no doubt. Allah said, sacrifice your Ismail. And everybody in this world got an Ismail. Everybody got an Ismail. It could be your race, you know, black nationalism. Black people fly backwards and all that, right? So you might love your race. That's close to you. It might be your PhD. I'm Dr. Brother, right? I've been sitting in the schoolhouse all this time to get my PhD. Now I'm Dr. Brother. That's your new identity. That could be your Ismail, right? It could be your wealth. Oh, I've had plenty of money now. I was broke a while back. Now I've got cars and money and I'm doing all right. Then somebody wants you to share that with somebody else or give that away for a good reason. I don't know about all that. You have to really pick out some rocks to throw at the shite time. <laughs> Is that right? Why? Because everybody has an smell. What is your smell? The higher you get up on the ladder, the taller you get, the more prosperous you get, it's harder to sacrifice your Ismail. Everybody has an Ismail. What is yours? Right? It could be your master. It could be anything. But there comes a time when it's for you to make a transition, for you to improve, for you to evolve to a higher level. There's something that you have to set aside or transform in order to make the transition. For Ibrahim, it was Ismail. But then, Allah said, lay it down, prostrate. Imagine you got to grab your side by the hair and put his neck back so you can see it real good. Cut his throat. We called out, O oh Abraham, thou hast already fulfilled thy vision. That means you may not have to give away your beautiful car and house and all that. You may just have to be ready to do it, <laughs> right? You have to be willing to do it. Ibrahim was ready for his son. His son was ready to be sacrificed. This was the end. That's what this, I, this, this is the end human sacrifice in that part of the world. No more human sacrifices in that part of the world. Why? There's the lamb. You have already fulfilled your vision. 
You don't have nothing else to do. Right? So Allah has placed that sacrifice there for you. There's a lamb without spot of blemish. This is the one that you sacrifice. Akula kawi hada astaghfirullah Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, La ilaha illallah. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, wa lillahi alhamd. And remember that Abraham was tried, Ibrahim was tried by his Lord with certain commands, which he fulfilled. He said, I will make thee an imam of the nations. He pleaded. Now, this is Ibrahim pleading with Allah. He pleaded, and also imams from my offspring, he answered. But my promise is not within the reach of the evildoers. Ibrahim is our father. Ibrahim was willing to, Ibrahim was the direct parent of uh, great, great, great uh, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam when we accept Islam, that means we are in the family too. So that means Ibrahim and we're monotheists. So Ibrahim is technically our father. And your father is asking Allah since I have fulfilled all of these covenants, does this transfer to my family? How is this with my offspring? Right? He said, yes, but it's not with the evildoers. That means you and I, whatever they have told us about ourselves, whatever the image they have given you and I, about ourselves. Whatever goals that we have, they might tell you that uh, using self-esteem, right, self-image, that you're not qualified to do that. You don't have it in you to do that. You're not big enough to do that, right? You're not tall enough. You're not light enough. You're not dark enough. Something, right? You can't do it. That old boss man shove all these drugs and stuff in our community, right? To kill that spirit in us. That great possibility. When we didn't really, right here as Muslims, we are in a very serious position, right? Y'all have seen the stuff on TV, Freedom Rides. 61, 62, 63, we march on Washington, right? I had a dream down there. Then black nationalism, 64, 65, black power, 68, and all that. And then finally BLA, Black Liberation Army, all the brothers. Uh, and then Islam. We inherited, right, the freedom movement. You and I did. But guess what? We sold it. We sold it to somebody that didn't live our experience. They didn't know what we were doing. I mean, what we've been living with. They started to get a piece of it. But immigrants came here in the 60s, 70s, and pretty soon, they had taken over the movement. All of our Negro brothers was working for them, right? Speaking at their conferences, carrying water for them. They're not bad. But when they come here, they develop an Islam, right, that's beneficial for them. So they want lectures and speakers, right? They don't want to make a new America. They want America to be like when they got here, right? <laughs> All they want is a job. They want education. That's what they want. They want to become Dr. Brother. That's why they came here. But there's a difference between an immigrant who comes here, 
He was overseas living under dictators and whatever's going on in, in America, he can at least work and, and get a few dollars, send a few dollars back home. But you and I, when we accepted Islam, we accepted Islam, especially in the old days, because we wanted to change America. We wanted to improve America. One of the great speeches of Imam Warathidin Muhammad in 76 in Philadelphia was remake the world, right? Remake the world. I don't know if that is this year. My y'all had a young man. But that was this, of course, 1976. He's saying to his community, we have a mission. We should have a goal to remake the world in which we live. Do you like it like it is? Right? The freedom you got here, the justice you got here, right? The love you get from the system. What do they say in D.C.? They say, I just heard it the other day. I don't really believe it. I don't see how it could be true. But they said, anybody heard it? It's 81, white folks have 81 times did anybody hear that? As much money as you do, right in D.C. 81 times a white family have 81 cents <laughs> back. This is, it don't make sense. That's what they say. That was NPR last night and this morning. They say, and they're going to have some programs to discuss how did that happen. You know, the Kerner Commission, 1967, I'm telling you, you see these people running around acting a fool today. We have to find out what the problem is. Colonel Commission said in 1967, it's poverty, it's police brutality. Do you know every so-called riot or rebellion they had in the 60s? You know why it was? Whether it was LA, whether it was Watts, didn't make no difference. It's because of police brutality. Them busting you upside the head, which I have a few that I carry even today from those days. What the danger? In those days, you could bust right outside the head and hurt that you might break the stick. <laughs> but now, what do we do? We have inherited, we have inherited a world that we want to change. But the immigrants hired us to speak on their platform. We didn't speak about our issues at all. We didn't speak about police brutality. We didn't speak about right, the assaults. Now everybody walking up down the street carrying signs, but they weren't thinking about it then. They didn't even know, right, the, what we was living, like what we take is wrong. But right, it's normal for the police to stop up and down the street. That is normal, right? It's normal. It ain't nothing extraordinary. But other people, they say, that's horrible. You mean they stop you? Why, that's against the Constitution. And they put their hands in your pocket or they frisk you and they put you in jail without no reason. I you should have heard the white folks down at the top of this one. This was a good demonstration. This was years ago when the first Black Lives Matter. And uh, you was there, remember that time? They was, uh, the young kids was doing it. And then they rose from New York, came talking that gangster talk, but we go, do, 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 do. I said, man, let me have a microphone. I got up there, I said, them people right there, they got a lot of people killed in the old days. Talking about what they gonna do. That police, if you don't like it, you know, I can't tell you to do nothing to them, but there they are. These people here came, half white, half black, mostly young kids, right? They're there to show their solidarity. They, you know what I mean, for each other, right? You know, the next time I saw those Negroes, I was in California, I was watching TV, and there they was. They was in Ferguson. You know what they were doing? Down there starting trouble trying to open up a door for the police to walk in, right? When we have demonstrations. Half the time, there's people burn, burning, throwing rocks and all that, right? They bringing heat on, they opening the door up for the police, right? 
to come in to hassle us. We have a peaceful demonstration. We know those things already. When we have a demonstration, we'd be down there and we'd tell them, we'd have a liaison between the police and us. And they would outline the demonstration they're going to have. And we'd talk to them, you know, what you want to do, how you want to do this. They said, well, we don't want you to do this. We said, well, we're going to burn the gravy flag, so you can forget about that. But if there's anything else, and then we would say, now, if anybody get out of line, if anybody go burn down some building or a house or any other property, they're not with us. So don't you come running in our ranks, running after them. Right? That's what you have to administer. Why? Because we know what we're doing here. Immigrants don't know that. I'm going to get to the point and wrap it up in a minute. We are now being offered another opportunity to rescue ourselves, our friends, and our family from America. To do good. But we have to sacrifice our naughty thinking. Right? We have to sacrifice, you know, when everybody was trying to get guns to shoot the police, you couldn't get no guns. Mm -hmm. But the minute they run our community full of drugs, and, and now you can get all the guns you want. Why? Because you ain't going to shoot no police. Look at the Negroes right outside. When the police come, they all throw their guns in the bushes right out there. At least they used to. They had been moved a little bit. Them niggas would throw their guns. They got guns. When the police come, they throw them in the bushes. When a Negro step on their shoe, they blow them away. No, this is important. Self-esteem. This is very important. If you want to go somewhere, if you want to do something, there's some obstacles in your way. That's why Ibrahim is time for you to grow. So now you have to sacrifice your Ismail. Whatever your Ismail may be uh, uh, running up and down the street shooting at each other instead of shooting at the police, right? You have to sacrifice your hatred and your dislike for your brother. That's your brother. You're going on the same street, going to the same school all your life, right? And now, boss man has flooded your community with drugs and guns, and you're going to fight over this coin after right? This month comes, right? And you're willing to kill for it. For sure, it's my Now, we'll wrap it up. Me and you, we got a chance to do something. Right now. We had a chance to, to help fix all of this with Islam. But we have to evolve this personal development. We have to evolve and we have to prepare ourselves for this struggle. Now remember, any fight you have, Allah is going to prepare you for that fight. If Allah wants you to spread his being according to the way it is, really is, right? He's going to prepare you. He ain't going to let you get in a fight if you're not prepared, right? Because you're doing a lost fight. All right. So let me wrap up a few more things. Well, that was Ibrahim raising the cow. Uh, the last thing I was just talking about was self-esteem self-image, and what have you, related to goal setting. Our goal, not America the great America, but America the good. Don't you want to live in a good society? <laughs> Just think about it. You got to think about it first. You got to believe it's possible. You have to believe that it's possible to live in a good society. The only thing is, you're going to have to produce it. <laughs> That's the only thing. Boss man ain't gonna produce it. Boss man got other things on his mind. Boss man is basically crazy. Yes. But how do you see yourself with the ability to change or to improve the world that you live in? 
Self-esteem, you hear it all the time. Esteem means to weigh, to measure, to value something, right? Esteem, self-esteem. If you don't believe you can, you won't be able to do it. If you don't believe that each other has the ability, right, to improve to the point that they can transform themselves to the level that they can transcend all the gravitational pull that holds them down uh, to this earth. Last thing I want to say is, <laughs> I'm going to really be brief on this, but uh, it's just basically the world in which we live in today. And I think that we ought to pay close attention to the world with Islamic positions. They got you running around on the boat and jump up and down. 2000 election. Y'all remember hanging chads? You ever heard of hanging chads? Down in Florida. The Democrats won. And then they took Florida back. Right? And they said, oh, it's Hanging chairs. You remember them hanging chairs and all that stuff they had from the computer glitches? That was 2000. So the Democrats lost. George Bush got in there, invaded Iraq, invaded Afghanistan, got over a million people killed over there and ran the American people crazy. But they weren't tired of yet, so here come old Kerry and they swift voted him. It's 2004. Y'all may not be paying attention to that. But they said, this thing is so bad, let's go. What can we do to fool everybody for real? So they go get a Negro. Right? They had that Negro plan a long time ago. When they won the Senate, Right? Didn't nobody run against himself another Negro from somewhere in Illinois, right? It's a free Senate. He gave a democratic speech. Before that, Barack Hussein Obama. They scheduled him. They selected him to be president. He's not, he's not tied to the old civil rights movement or none of that, right? He's brand spanking new. He ain't got no ties here. He's been everywhere else but here. School in Indonesia. He's been everywhere, but he has been in the black room until they just told him to go join this and that for about two, three minutes. Right? Married, dark skinned woman, smart move. Right? The woman got more sense than he did. You can see that. He's a Right? Tell the truth. That was smart move on his part to endear him to the American people. Then he hangs around a while. Then they got your homeboy in there. And I know everybody is confused about Don. Why is he there? Well, they put him there. They put him there for a reason. I'm going to be brief. They put him there to mess up everything so bad, right? He'll mess up everything so bad that all they'll tell you to do is you got to really vote this time, right? It's all about the vote. They can put in there anybody they want. They've been putting anybody they want in there for I don't know how long, right? So Don is just that. This boy ain't got no sense at all, tell the truth. He don't learn from nothing. He's like me and you most of the time. He don't pay no attention. He go to jail, he tell everybody, I like the people in jail, I like the criminals, I like, I like everybody. Anything he's supposed to not say, he says it, right? He reads the, the Hitler handbook and everybody knows it comes from the Hitler handbook. It's all in this, everybody knows where he's coming from. That's to scare us to death. So we'll vote. It's about voting. 
As simple as that. They can't come and tell everybody because the Congress got 9%. How I many is the it's so low they like them nine percent of the people. And they don't, they don't get no high scores. So they've got to keep people attached to the system. Right? That's what it's all about. So Don gets to go in there and show his behind. And then we'll all run down there by the meetings and vote him out. But you don't never get nobody you want, right? You don't have nobody you like. That's why what Islam is for. This whole world is going crazy. If we live up to our Islam, we'll be like Ibrahim. Inna Ibrahim Akana Umata. Tiny kind of light, we will be a model. That's one of the words for me. We will be example. But what good? If me and you practice Islam the way it's supposed to be practiced, everybody in America is going to say, hey, we like that. Because everybody is practicing insanity in America right now. Tell the truth. They just about to went crazy. All the way crazy, not partially crazy. They didn't go crazy. So now if we show them how to be human beings, if the Negro, with all the baggage he carried, right, began to live an improved, a polished, a productive life, then everybody's going to look at that and say, well, there's people don't want to hang on by the Negro. Well, have you ever heard of Vanilla Ice and who are all these other white folks? What music do they listen to in America? They didn't told you. You don't let, I live in all over the world. You know one thing they left? Negroes. And Negro music. I was down in South America. I used to go to the gym every day. And uh, I'm down there. You know it. Uh, smuggling cocaine and stuff. And I'm in the gym. And my friends in the gym, they just say, hey, why don't you sing us a song? I didn't tell the man, I'm a gangster. I'm like, come on, what are you talking about? Sing you a song. <laughs> but they thought, I'm black, I'm from America. I got rhythm, right? What else could he think? That's that, he didn't do nothing wrong. He just thought automatically. And everywhere you go, they got Russians rapping, right, for the last 20 years. They got Mexicans rapping. They got Chinese rappers, right now, Chinese rappers. They got everybody imitating you because people are looking, those people are still there after slavery, after Jim Crow, after all of that, they still alive? Good God Almighty, right? <laughs> That's what the people are thinking. And in the old days, we used to seem like we was having fun. You know, I told you this. I was at the joint at the North Park campus uh, working out and then the, the white folks that uh, you know would get cases. And it was three teams to log it. It's down in Florida, they got the, about four years of peace. No, the one guy took a fall for the other team to log it. There was three of them. He took the fall. And he got four years and almost ran him crazy, right? When I left Florida going to some other joint in California, I saw the guy again. His, his back was broke over and he didn't know what to do hardly. And I found out something about Europeans. When I got to Lumpac, it was a big group of, let's say, white folks. And they was looking at the Negroes. They was partying, they was laughing, they was joking. And then by the time we got out of the camp, you know, they came directly to the camp. You know, the big white folks would say, yeah, we was in the barbershop one day, and one white man talking to another. He said, yeah, I've never had handcuffs on in my life. And he 
they say, yeah, me neither. They just called me and come and me. Because they do, they call the white folks. They tell them, they'll call you and say, hey, we got you. Hey, do you want you to come down and check in and then we'll relieve you. Do they do that? They don't do that to you, right? Because you're not white. And you don't have enough money. That's why they don't do that to you. You ain't never seen no Negro laying up in his bunk at 12 o'clock and a judge called the penitentiary, Michael Bilkin, whatever his name was. They tell him, you can go home. And the fine you got, all them millions of dollars, you can pay back the same way you got in here. If they put him in the penitentiary for junk bonds, you can pay us your fine. <laughs> They jump on them. They don't do that for me and you. But here's the thing. They was looking at blacks just laughing and talking. And I realized something. I started in a group. You know what that group is? At 4 o'clock count, we go over by the nursery and we sit down that cross lane. You know what I taught white folks how to do? It's time. They was going crazy. You know the rich white folks when they go to the penitentiary? They don't know nothing about doing time. We grew up in the penitentiary, right? So we taught them, and they thought I was a guru sitting cross-legged. You know what I mean? I didn't have no long hair, nothing, but I was, you know, sound philosophical and stuff like that. And they was heated up. They liked it. I was helping them. How to do time. They just never did no time. All the money they stole. I have them come and teach at the Muslim class. The guy comes and says, well, I'll teach you guys about the banking and what have you. The Negroes didn't even want to know. I just wanted them to come to teach us how, you know, how they handle money. And the Negroes would forget. But anyway, we have so much that we don't know that we have. Islam has given us a chance to use everything we have that made the talk so long. Thank you very much for paying attention. This is no uh, zakat or sadaqah, but if you want to put something in the box, enjoy yourself. And as a, that box over there, uh, we started a new program, Imam Jamil out of me. Our goal is to raise a million dollars to get him out of the prison before he goes blind and everything else has happened. I was just told the other week. And we was having a fundraiser for him before. We raised about $100,000. Well, technically, we raised three or $400,000. We took it to, down to Atlanta, but it was trial 20 years ago. But now, we had raised some more money, and then the government kind of just took it. They do this $100,000. But they come. Now we're going to start a whole new show. Because from what I hear about Imam Jamil, remember, we haven't got the one or two heroes from those days. From those days. And the other people forget it. You see all the people, the casket, John Lewis, everybody. Oh, John Lewis. John Lewis. And Imam Jamil was friends. Except Imam Jamil was more like Burn, Baby Burn, a you know, old revolutionary in those days. And this guy, he forgave all the white folks, busting them upside the head, but he didn't forgive Imam Jamil for nothing. He forgave all the white folks, but he forgave, no, he ain't forgave Imam Jamil. They was in a snick together. And he knew what the government did to Dr. King, so he would uh, know what they've been doing to Muslims. The Patriot Act, right? Islamophobia all these years, right? He knew that. He didn't say nothing. That's why they carried his casket all over him saying good stuff about it. Because if he had stood up for what he shouldn't have standing up for, they'd have buried him, throw him in the ground, and throw the cement block on him. But anyway, we thank y'all very much uh, for coming, and we're going to have uh, food right down there. And uh, uh, yeah, that would be fine. Uh, 
access, we can just ease on out and continue if you like. If somebody just want to eat up here, it's fine. But we want to stay here. Yes, did you say that you have a small <laughs> He's, he's going fine, you know, like, along with, uh, we're trying to get him to this next stage of this procedure that he needs. They're supposed to reverse this catatonic state that he's in. I talk to him two, three times a day, I FaceTime. I talk to him, he talks to me. He's very alert, he knows what's going on, it's just his response is a little bit delayed. But uh, as Muslims, we know that the only person that can help him is Allah. So I ask the community to make do all. Time. Take your time. Song. And the song is in his heart, and it don't matter, it's been, I know it over a year, but uh, it's in it. It's in it, and Charlotte ain't going away. He, uh, I just want to get him back to what he does. And uh, even him being in the hospital, when he is up to park, and they ask him, what is it? First thing my dad says is, I got work to do. And they ask why, he says, because I'm a member of a community, and we got work to do. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Y'all got to understand, my dad wants to be the same. And it's to me and my brother. All he needs to do one. He needs that. And, uh, the only one that can help him out is the law. So I asked the brothers, inshallah, if he had the time to understand the power of do all, and he needs it, and if a law wills this to happen for him, if it happen for him, inshallah, I hope you all see him soon. But uh, I just asked him, and I'm sorry. I love this dude to death. We love him too. He's been through a lot. I trust him. When y'all ask about him, I let him know each and every time one of y'all asks about him. And it's uplifting to him to know that people care about him so much. You know what I mean? That's why I would say keep him on the door because you know, the door saved him when he first had it. You know what I mean? So we know the power of him. Inshallah. Inshallah, we're going to get him back in the morning. I remember a brother who fell and been here almost 30 years since we was over on H Street. And uh, in fact, he's one of the only originals that has been here that long and that down with uh, all our hopes and dreams and aspirations. And then there's a hadith that said there's no petition between uh, the oppressed and doer. So we'll finish with Surah Barni Rabbana la dhikru wa ba'da ikhadaykana wa habbana bin ladun wa rahmatan inna ka inna wuha Rabbana inna ka jadiru naisu inna wa naru inki inna la la yukhi kutiya Rabbana akina fi dunya hasana wa fi akhir Hasana wa akidada ala ha Allahumma ta salamu wa mikra salamu Kabaraka la ilaha wa la fitra Alhamdulillah Takbir Allahu Akbar Takbir Allahu Akbar Takbir Allahu Akbar